Hey, everybody. Welcome to a new year and a new volume of Crew Call. This is Crew Call 3-1. And um, it's a little late, but uh, better late than never. You know, I'm not firmly committed to the 20th to, uh, to drop the show. It just didn't work out this time. Uh, but I'm here tonight with JT Burke of Scale Sound Systems. We're going to have, a, uh, I think, a, a pretty interesting uh, sound nerd conversation here. So I hope you, uh, hope you enjoy it. Welcome, JT. Hey, how's it going, Mike? It's going well for an old guy, you know. I mean, I managed to hang in there. Yeah, you're looking um, good. You know, you you and I got together um, as a referral from a referral, and I'll clarify on that. Um, uh, Mike Confalone, uh, a good buddy of mine, and and somebody I do a lot of installs for, um, also knows Tim Garland. I'm sure you know Tim. And uh, Tim has a nice, a nice railroad called the Seaboard Central. And I think he is on uh, Mike's uh, Allagash uh, Facebook group. And they had just got chatting back and forth. And um, uh, Tim had, had said to Mike, you know, um, you should check out these, uh, these scale sound speakers. And um, of course, Mike contacted me and I just, I just groaned. I saw my life flash before my eyes because I know how many installs I've done for him. And it's one thing to do a retrofit as opposed to planning it from scratch, you know? Right. Um, but I kind of, uh, you know, reluctantly grumbled and said, order some up and have them sent to me directly and I'll look at it, you know? And basically in that tone. So yes. I'm not always like that, but you think you <laughs> caught me in a bad day, you know? Yeah. So, um, the rest is history. I mean, I'm I'm now a, a dealer for your for your speakers. I'm I'm completely sold. Um, they've 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 solved my 645 turbo problem, which is something <laughs> we get into a little bit uh, yeah. a little bit further. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to chat a little bit about the evolution of of sound and speakers. Remember remember back in the early days when manufacturers first started uh, putting sound in. Um, and I, and I use sound in quotation marks because, <laughs> boy, some of it sounded like a Norelco shaver, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, re I remember putting an Atlas Beaten 23 on the track and cranking it up. And the first thing I thought was, no, please no, you know? And, and they went through that whole period where I guess they, they were putting a lot of research into, into getting the cheapest speaker possible uh, to put into a locomotive. Mm -hmm. So back in those days, I think the first ones I started using were uh, Railmaster, you know, the little cone yep. uh, box speakers. Yep. And, uh, and those were big and I had to find ways of getting them in, but we were using bulbs at the time. So it wasn't a problem. Um, then Confalon decided he wanted to use LEDs and we, 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 we uh, kind of set, settled on a type of LED that had big wires coming off the back and shrink tubing and built-in lenses. And that meant that my big DSM-8 speakers didn't fit. And that's when I started using and, and fooling around with the various cell phone speakers. Yep. Um, and you know, not all of those are created equal either. I've tried them all. Right. Some are better than others. And I swear that not all the iPhone, iPhone, iPhone 4 speakers are, are the same, even though they look the same. Yeah, they're not. Yeah. So um, when I first tried to train your speakers, uh, I did it specifically because the 645 turbos were sounding bad, just bad. A friend of mine who used to be uh, an engineer said, well, they're annoying even on the prototype. <laughs> <laughs> it's that turbo wine, you know, yeah, yeah. but when you have that turbo wine in lieu of anything else, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah. it's not ideal, you know? So yeah. when I did the first one of your speakers, I, it must've been in a, actually it might've been in a GP 39 dash two and put it on the track. And immediately I thought, okay, now we're talking about something completely different here, <laughs> but of course it takes up so much room in the car body that you have to switch over to the JT LEDs and, and we'll talk about that. That's also been um, a bit of a learning curve also, but I'm right. really liking them now. Oh, good, thanks. So let me ask you, rather than monopolize this whole thing, what's your background? Like, is this your full-time gig? Is it a part-time gig? Uh, you're obviously an audio guy, so just kind of fill us in here. Yeah, um, 
is it a full-time gig? It's not supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> um, it's been that way uh, for the past year. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Not not entirely. I still do um, studio work. Of course, um, the pandemic hit and uh, all my like concert and live work, you know, went away at the beginning of March. So you're a recording engineer and a, 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 a commercial sound guy, like a, a, you'll run a soundboard at a concert. Yeah, that um, systems design engineering. Um, some of the some of the big tours that have been out and stuff, you know, I've yep. um, designed sound systems for, and 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 then sometimes I go on the tours, and you know, when you walk into an arena and you see all the speakers up in the air and stuff oh, like yeah. that, that's what I did um, in the live sector. Yep. Um, and then I was also an audio engineer. I, I've mixed front of house and monitors for a number of a variety of bands over the years. Yep. Um, and um, and then recording studio work and. Um, that's what I've done my whole life. I mean, I started doing this uh, in my early teens. Uh, well, I became infatuated with recording myself playing instruments when I was still in a single digit age. So you're a musician um, also. Yeah, I mean, uh, we'll use that word loosely because the, uh, you know, I can, I do play on records. Um, what do you play? Basically I, basically I play when I needed to play, but I don't sit around practicing anymore. Um, See, George Martin. Yeah, I mean, sure. Not not w without without uh, the opportunities that George Martin had. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> that guy was the right place, right time kind of. Sure situation. was. Um, yeah, so uh, that's what I do for a living, and um, uh, I started this endeavor like you. I hated sound when it came out. I've been a lifelong model railroader. Yeah. But um, when sound came out. Um, and, and really all, I mean, the early QSI stuff, the early sound, the early soundtrack stuff, the early low sound stuff, I, it was terrible. It, really bad. It, it was white noise or just crackles or you couldn't even make anything out of it. And when you used a, a better quality speaker, it still sounded bad because it was so low resolution. Sure. And I thought, no, we're, we're not, you know, we'll let this mature for a while. Well, you know, you're, you're looking at it from the... I don't want to say audiophile, but you know, someone with a trained ear perspective. Right. Um, I I had a recording studio when when I was younger, right. a little younger than you. Uh, I mean, I think I started recording when I was uh, maybe late teens, you know, and I I kind of ramped up to the point where we had a, a semi-pro studio with a a one-inch uh, Scully a, a track, and, right. and I enjoyed it. I mean, I did. Um, I also tried to play a little bit myself in a in a sort of a band, uh, so I have a little bit of a feel for that. But it was clear to me that I wasn't going to be any musician. I didn't love to practice, you know. And you kind of right. have to do that if you're going to oh, be yeah. good at at music. Yeah. So I quickly realized that I, my my efforts were better spent, you know, elsewhere. Right. Um, but there's no question that when you're uh, as, the, as the recording engineer, you are responsible for capturing sound properly. Right. And I, I think that it does something in terms of the way you your attention to detail is with, with sounds. So you clearly applied that to, the, to solving the problem of why do, why do sound in the locomotive sound so bad, right? Right, yeah, yeah, once... Once um, it was around 2015, I was I, I came a little bit late to to DCC sound because I had just written it off. Right. And it was around 2015, um, right around the time Tsunami and uh, Loke Sound Select, Loke Sound Four. Um, that's when I started thinking we can work with this, and and uh, so in between tours and, and records and that kind of thing, I was here in my in my workshop um experimenting with with uh trying to come up with a speaker that sounded better i had tried the cell phone speakers and i tried the um other manufacturers speakers and i thought i mean you know this is okay but um i understand electroacoustics i know how this stuff works um maybe i can do something better and um well you're just, trying to circumvent the laws of physics because you can't have a big box 
Yeah, right. You can't. And that, that, um, I tried to apply a lot of the principles that I understand about speaker design, um, the stuff that I've learned, the stuff I've been trained in, um, in the concert world or the recording studio monitor world. I tried to initially was trying to use a lot of those same principles and realizing that there are a lot of, uh, factors that they're not scaling down. Right. And, uh, and not to mention that, you know, we almost always use a full range driver and, um, you know, um, as opposed to a woofer and tweeter. Yeah. And a concert system, you know, you could have, you've got your highs, your high mids, your low mids, sometimes your lows and then subs, you can have a four or five way crossover system in a, in large studio monitors or a concert sound system. So, you know, uh, looking at a subwoofer design and how it's ported and vented and thinking that you can just apply that to a, a full range speaker box, it's not going to work the same. So, so how did you take the approach that you did? What were you, what, what was the angle without giving away any trade secrets, of course? Well, part of it was um, looking for the right driver. And, um, and just so that people know it professionally, what, you, what people refer to as a speaker and professionally that's called a driver or a transducer. Um, a speaker um, is a complete assembly with an enclosure and everything. And uh, so uh, I went through and, and bought every driver that was available on the market and, and through electronics distributors and that kind of thing. Um, hundreds of drivers. I was thinking that sounds like a lot. Yeah, um, I, I invested heavily. Uh, and so everything from your typical cone driver that people are familiar with, like the 16 by 35 cone driver to, uh, you know, what people refer to as a sugar cube. Um, uh, professionally, that's called a, a, a micro driver or a precision micro driver. Sugar cube is a, is a Zemo marketing term. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, I just started going through all of these and, um, you know, I've got calibrated measurement equipment. Um, and so I just started measuring all this stuff and figuring out what driver is going to give me the best performance. Now, when you say yeah. you get calibrated measuring equipment, you mean like a spectrum analyzer and um... it's, it's way more advanced than a spectrum analyzer. And okay. it's more advanced. When I say FFT, uh, people can say, well, I can get an FFT app on my phone. Well, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a little different. This is a dual F, dual trace FFT. Okay. It uses um, an outboard microphone that is calibrated to sure. the software and it's comparing the electrical charge, the electrical uh, signal path to the acoustic signal path. And then it's comparing those two and it, it, it's incredibly accurate and it's very high resolution. It's so, I mean, so did you create like a mini anechoic chamber to, to monitor these things with? So um, what I what I usually use is I do suspend the speakers in free space, and uh, and I'll, I'll use my recording studio. It's not anechoic, but it's controlled. It's acoustically controlled. Okay. And and, and more and more more acoustically neutral, and so um, but with speakers this small, um, the the volumes are not uh, are not high, and. Um, there, we're not going down to 40 hertz, which, you know, when you, when you get, when you get that low into, into the frequency res response, that's when, it, when your room acoustics really start to become an issue. So the, at the beginning, I imagine it was basic research. You wanted to see what each of these speakers was putting out and sort of comparing that to what your ears told you about them, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm measuring and listening for distortion. And when I say distortion, I don't mean like um, the speakers crackling, like audibly crackling. Right. I'm talking about um, harmonic distortion. And then there's even um, a more complicated distortion. It's called intermodulation distortion, which is uh, some indifference of, of, of varying harmonics. And um, IMD is very displeasing to the ear. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I'm listening to those things. I'm listening to transient response how fast the, the diaphragm can react to sounds, how yep. fast it can move. And sensitivity, um, I guess, because you know you don't have much power coming in. Yeah, 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 you can get, and, and that's always kind of an issue because a driver, uh, a driver that has good low frequency potential 
um, is generally going to be a little less sensitive because the voice coil is wound heavier, the, the mass of the diaphragm is heavier, there's the motor of the speaker um, is, is, is just beefier. And so it takes, you know, it requires more power to reproduce low frequencies. So, so, so that little driver that you use, is it the same one in every speaker? No, um, I've actually, so while I was on that path, um, I, found a, I found a really good part and I contacted the manufacturer and I bought their entire inventory of it. Um, and when I went to go get more, uh, I had learned that the tooling in China had been damaged. And uh, so I offered, I said, what will we do? You know, I offered to pay to have it repaired. Um, and it's really only, it's really around 15 to $18,000 to tool up one, one driver. That wasn't um, too unreasonable for me, but this manufacturer wanted me to commit to $100,000 up front to get it back into production. And uh, I sell a lot of speakers, but fronting $100,000- uh, That's a lot of speakers. To retool the driver was not gonna happen. So, right. <laughs> um, so I'm, we, uh, I, I've been working with another, uh, on a, with another driver that's very good. And um, I just went through this past fall, uh, massive quality control issues with it. And the factory thought I was nuts. And um, they said, send us samples because all the, all the ones that we've got here are, are two specs. So send us samples. And I, I returned the samples and they came back and, and had a list of points of, of the, what, was, what was wrong with the more recent batches in the manufacturing. And they said, we're sorry. We're, so we're it was a physical issue in, yeah, there was in the like, QC? Yeah, part of them, yeah, like the the center magnet within the pole piece was being was offset by just like a hundred thousandth of an inch. Yeah, it doesn't take um, much because everything's uh, so tiny. Yeah, um, there was uh, there was blue that was leaking into the uh, voice coil, um, and all of these things were contrib were contributing to the performance issues that I was hearing. And I'm thinking, I'm telling them, you know, this isn't right. And so they actually went through and corrected all of that, and I'm getting the next batch uh here any time well chinese are going into, they're going to the chinese holiday so th there might be a delay but i do have a few different drivers that i use across the product range to suit different things so is that related to the size of the enclosure it can be because obviously the the smaller the smaller enclosures it helps me to use a smaller driver and honestly a smaller driver oftentimes will perform better on a smaller enclosure um, you'll, you can get a lower resonance um, with, if you're matching the driver to the enclosure size a little bit better. Um, and uh, sometimes it can be my Steam series of speakers use a completely different driver. Uh, what shocks people is that um, I have found that optimal, the optimal driver is not necessarily the best suited for Steam and diesel. So diesel has got um, a continuous kind of rumble you know, um, steam has got a very percussive um, chuff. And uh, so the speakers that I use in my steam series, uh, they sound good for diesels, but they really come alive with steam. And so they must have better transient response? It's, I think it's, I think it really has more to do with the, the, the damping of the, of the driver. Um, it's a firmer, stiffer sound. So it doesn't have like this pillowy, nice, warm bottom end with a diesel, which the drivers that I use for my diesels have got that nice kind of a bloom in the lower frequencies. That's what we um, like. <laughs> and right, but you put that with steam and it kind of it kind of falls apart. Interesting. So the driver that I use in my steam series has got the suspension is a little tighter and, and it, it's damped down and it, it can, you can really just pump that chuff through them and it, handles it nicely so these speakers that i'm sorry these transducers that we're using okay mm -hmm. were they purpose built for for this application or are they were they designed uh, with another another purpose in mind i mean are they, are they from the cell phone world the ones that i use are just in general with what you're talking in general or the ones that i use specifically well I thought they were one and the same, but, but obviously not. 
Well, I, I mean, I have stuff built to me to a higher spec. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, but they're, they're sort of built the same way, right? Yeah. With that, sure. with that, you know, rectangular, I guess it's a, it's a metallic uh, membrane. Um, that is well, the so-called cone. My, mylar is, is, uh, is the membrane that I use in most of mine. Okay. Um, but they do, I mean, you'll see aluminum, um, you'll see different types of poly. Um, okay. There's there, you can, you can have them, you know, these things are made for a variety of industries worldwide. So it just kind of depends on what the end, end goal is. So you have your, you have your, uh, your driver in, that's part of what makes it makes your product uh, what it is, but the enclosure is something completely different. Now, I, I inadvertently uh, got to see the inside of one of your enclosures the other day. I think we talked about that. Um, and you had mentioned to me that the enclosure is not necessarily the same thickness throughout, which I found very interesting. Right. So yeah. did, now do you 3D print these yourself or do you have them made? I do. I've got a little, I have a printer farm. Um, it's a small one, but I've got, um, right now I have two, two resin printers and five filament printers and, you know, to try to keep up with things. Uh, do you, do you basically get the same result out of each? It's just a matter of duty cycle or speed. Uh, I mean, they're all the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, you said yeah. resin versus filament, so I didn't. Oh, the resin is what I use for my detail parts and lighting kits. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and then the filament printers are what make the speakers. I've tried the speakers with the resins and other resins, and I don't care for the acoustic qualities of the of the resins. So, what are you trying to achieve with the different thickness of the box in, in yeah. different spots? Yeah. So it's um, it uh, the way the box is made. You can add mass to the box, and um, you know it. You hear a lot of people. Well, they 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 take things from marketing, you know, hi-fi and car audio marketing and and stuff they read on the internet, and you know they're like, you know, you got to eliminate the resonance of your speaker enclosure, and you've got to you know get that mass up so that you get the truest purest sound. But uh, what happens? And I learned this from an engineer at a, at a high-end uh, speaker manufacturer, um, ten thousand dollars studio speakers, you know. And and uh, he goes, you know, you can do that. Um, as you increase the mass, you increase the resonance, and so um, the resonant frequency. So as the box gets thicker and heavier, the the resonance of the enclosure is going to curve up. And, you know, so what you've got to do is you got to. And, and before you go further, um, why don't you would just quickly explain resonance and how that translates into what you're actually hearing? <laughs> I don't know if I've ever been asked to explain resonance. Um, it's it's. A, I'd hate a, to have to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's acoustic vibrations. Um, because there's different forms of resonance. There's sympathetic resonance. There's acoustic resonance. There's, um, I guess, acoustic resonance would be uh, uh, as the box is vibrating, um, the, the driver is creating air air pressure into the enclosure, and as the enclosure is vibrating, you know that. I guess we could look up the dictionary of resonance and see what that says, but um, uh, the. The box is, it's a combination of sympathetic and acoustic resonance because the driver is mechanically attached to the box, but then there's also air movement inside. Now, uh, is the box, all the boxes are sealed, I take it? As of now, all of mine are sealed. I do experiment with uh, porting and venting and open-ended transmission lines. Uh, the, the problem is, is when you port or vent uh, a, a small a speaker a small speaker you've got to have enough path length off the off the back side of the speaker you have to have enough path length to have that port tuned to a certain uh, you know a low enough resonance and so what um, I think I think a lot of people think that enclosures are are ported or vented uh, to increase low frequency response but they're not the purpose of a port or a vent in any speaker even a subwoofer is 
designed to increase efficiency, uh, volume. Really? Um, so now certain things, tra certain transmission line designs can extend the low frequency response a little. Like a folded horn. It's kind of like, yeah. yeah a clip it, speaker or something like that. Remember those? Kind of, yeah, a transmission line is sort of like a folded horn, but it doesn't necessarily follow any kind of exponential curve um, like a traditional horn would. See, I told, um, I told people we we're going to nerd out with our audio here. Yeah. So for instance, a cell phone speaker, um, all the cell phone speakers are ported, but they're ported to increase, to make the, to increase the sensitivity so that the speaker can get louder at, with lower amount of power. Right. And, and so it, uh, and optimized for a, a much narrower range of, oh yeah. I mean, cell phone speakers are designed to, uh, to best reproduce the human voice. That's the purpose of a cell phone speaker. So um, it's not designed, you can play music on it, you can watch videos on it, you know, and it'll sound okay. They definitely sound better now than what they used to. They sound um, better than they should. <laughs> for how small they are. Yeah. Right. Right. But, um, but it's not really designed, uh, the, the, the sole purpose of a cell phone speaker is, is for uh, ringtones and speakerphone to be to, to be most sensitive for the human ear, um, not to be well. They couldn't get any bass out of them anyway because there's just they they really are too small. But all right, so let's get back to your enclosure. So you're at, at some point, rather than just making a box, you somehow conclude that it shouldn't be the same thickness walls throughout. Right, yeah. Was that, so, was that a, re a revelation one day, or did you kind of know that going in? No, I knew it going in just from other other speaker design and professionally with okay. larger systems and boxes. Um, and again, just things that I learned from uh, these these designers. You know that I knew that the box, um, the thickness and the mass of the box had an impact on the overall resonance. And, and you, so you wanna tune that box to a resonant point that enhances uh, the listening experience. It, you know, you can't just throw a bunch of material together uh, and hope that it works. Right, but I mean, I, I imagine there was quite a bit of trial and error. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that uh, an understatement? <laughs> yeah, uh, when I, it took a long time first developing, recognizing patterns. I mean, it took hundreds of design iterations over very, over over the course of working through various models. Okay. So, for instance, the the Atherin Genesis um, GP thirty eight through fifty speaker that I make, uh, which was one of the first ones that you bought, um, that has probably changed design four times since I released it three years ago. Really? Because when I released it three years ago, I thought I had, you know, and then as I designed other speakers, I started seeing other patterns and what I'm doing with the internal things or the thickness or where the driver is placed. And I thought, let's, let's revisit the 3850 and see if I can bring a little bit more out of it. So yeah, it's a lot easier for me now than what it was because I, I have started recognizing more patterns of behavior. Well, um, at this point, you're building on years of experience doing just that, so. Right, um, but at, at, the, you know, at the end of the day, there are still, when I come out with a new speaker for a new locomotive, I still might have three or four different versions that I make and then do listening tests and some measurements and see which one I like, which one, you know, I like better. And you have to use the same driver. And so, you know, that's the- uh, It's a matter uh, of eliminating variables if you're gonna do a fair comparison. Right, so I might have four different enclosure designs and I put the driver on one, record and measure it, put the same driver on the second enclosure, record and measure it. And then I, I can take these files into my studio and load them up into Pro Tools and they can all be perfectly volume matched. And then I can just A, B, C, D, you know, compare back to back to back, listening to the slightest nuance of each design. So you you have quite a number of, uh, of SKUs at this point and the number just keeps going up. 
Um, <laughs> one one uh, becomes aware of that when they go to your website uh, and goes page after page after page through all of the different models. It's well presented in that each one that you click on, you know, you can you can get a. I like the way you have a stock photo. You show it with, a, let's say, a tsunami. You show it with a low sound decoder, um, which helps from the installer standpoint of trying to understand the issues of what you might be running into to to get the speaker into the locomotive. Um, some of your enclosures, I, I noticed, uh, and I, I couldn't tell you offhand which one we're talking about, but you'll know, um, have like a little groove in the top of it that lets uh, either the wiring or the light bar go through that area. Yeah. Is that, a, is, is that for a cuddle or I'm trying to remember now which ones have that? Um, I mean, the like the Atlas MP15 switcher has it. Um, the Atherm Genesis, there we go. So this is the speaker that would go in um, an Atherm Genesis GP79 or 15. Yep. And the the um, and the you, the the holes there. It, there's the hole in the middle that the truck wires and speaker wires can go up through, and then the two mounting holes. And then there's that. I don't, yeah, you can see that that That's groove, the groove there. And what I was running into was on a typical uh, Jeep seven or nine, um, the, not having this groove was fine. When you get to the Jeep 7s, 9s, or whatever that have the Southern Pacific light package, you've got this fat cable harness. <laughs> and so I had to put that groove in there. And so, yeah, that's, it's just- now How does uh, that groove affect the sound? It does. It does affect the sound a little. Um, you, you lose a little bit of cubic volume. And because, because this backside now, now instead of this, Instead of this backside of the enclosure being a nice smooth uh, panel that, that behaves like a drum head. So you can think of an enclosure behaving like a drum head. It, it's resonating. With this groove that adds rigidity across this. And that does, that's gonna shift the that's gonna shift the uh, the resonance up a little. So but is it safe to say you get a little less low end from it? A little bit, but it's not, I mean. I, I, I notice it doing the controlled listening, uh, comparative listening in the studio. Um, your average user is not going to miss it. Well, you know, it's all about variables, right? When you're trying to do comparisons, and that's what makes it so hard. Uh, when I was first evaluating that first speaker, I happened to have several GP39-2s that I was working on. So I was able to try a couple of different approaches and pretty, pretty quickly understand you know what what the differences were but we find that even different manufacturer shells can have an effect on on the sound you're going to get out of a locomotive sure. uh, you know an atlas classic has a much heavier more rigid shell so it sounds a lot different from say a, a an atherin genesis shell right. which right. is relatively flimsy by comparison right with lots uh, of open vents that's right. That's right. Now we usually try to seal the uh, the fan openings. I think you said you do that too. Well, I mean, it's it's not that I do it if they request it. Some people some people want the the aired out vents, but yeah, I mean, you don't want your prime mover sound coming out of the radiator fans, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it and it really is. Um, it's we like it's, it going down. That seems to be the most effective. Right, and that's what I've kind of shifted to um, when I can. Pushing, pushing, uh, having the driver facing uh, down through the the drive shaft and the trucks hitting the track, um, and that's actually worked to my benefit because it's it, it these those designs have helped help me look get a little extra lower resonance. Um, that the first the first thirty eight fifty speaker that I made for the Genesis, the driver was on top. So and now you know it's it's on the bottom and it fires down over the drive shaft. Right. So, um, so how long these days does it take you when a new locomotive comes out to develop a, a speaker for it? Is it a, a pretty quick process or is it still a lot of trial and error? You know, it depends on the complexity. Some of them are cut and dry. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes I'm taking measurements and, and doing multiple prints not for acoustics, but just to get the fit just right. Right. Um, you know, the, once we get the fit right, um, it can, 
you know, it's not, it could be a couple of hours of time invested in getting something that, that, I mean, that's not bad. That works good for, yeah. I mean, I, it, it's much better now than what it was. <laughs> Would you agree that uh, end cab switches continue to be the biggest challenge? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, they definitely don't have the room. Um, you know, I, if you want to keep the cab interior, they don't, they don't really have the room, but, um, it, I don't find them all that challenging because, uh, the sound ready, I mean, almost everything is sound ready now. And, and, um, the ones that aren't like the Athern, um, RTR 1000, 1500, you know, um, nope, I don't have, you know, I thought I had one sitting there. Um, it, uh, I made a little speaker for that, that, um, you know, it's not huge, but it still sounds, I think really good, you know, so. So you, you also do sound installs, correct? <laughs> you used to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I've got a backlog of a few months right now. Um, because just because the speaker and part manufacturing aspect of the business has overrun mushroom. Everything. Yeah. And, um, and when you think about it, the time it takes to do an install and what you get from that, as opposed to what you get from, you know, running your much larger business. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of a no brainer, right? Yeah. And it's not, you know, it's not the headaches. I know, I know a lot of people, not a lot of people, my customers don't, and your customers probably don't either, but you hear a lot of people complaining about the price of what a DCC sound install costs to have done. And it, first you of all- You can get it done cheaply or you can get it done properly. Right. Kind of no right. in between really. Right. And as an installer, you're, you're uh, taking on the, the uh, responsibility of that, owner's locomotive if you break right. or damage a part or lose a part it's up to you to replace it and fix and, it and there are locomotives you work on and i suppose they should remain nameless but they kind of dissolve while you're working on them <laughs> yeah and so, i charge you know, more for those because i basically have to reassemble the damn thing before i send it back right, right. it's all there's, about my time really yeah, yeah there's installers take on a lot of liability reputable installers take on a lot of liability when they receive a customer's locomotive. And, and then it's not just the, the act of doing the install itself. There are times where I'm researching, golly, Ned, what horn did this prototype use? <laughs> right. Because the customer is not sure, right. you know, and- uh, and, and probably then, wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then the time spent, you know, just doing the programming and fine tuning the programming and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's, it, there's a lot more time involved than what people think and-, and right. uh, it's pretty easy to lose your shirt on an install. Yeah. Uh, and we bought, I'm sure, I'm sure we could compare some stories, but the reason I brought that up is it's clear that the experiences of doing your own installs have driven a lot of the neat features of how you install your products. Uh, I'm sure that you didn't set out to offer lighting, but you quickly realized that if you were going to be doing this, you needed to have a lighting solution that worked. Right. So I remember when I first looked at your lights and I thought, you gotta be kidding me. I got to build this thing from scratch. What the heck is that? And then I, then I, you know, pretty quickly I realized, oh, okay. It's really not that hard to, to put the thing together. It was something else to do that I didn't have to do prior to, you know, uh, right. But I quickly realized the benefits of the form factor, you know, the, the way that the wires can come off of the light uh, lenses basically at a 90 degree angle and shoot right up to get out of the way of, of, of your speaker. Right. Um, the silver tape, is that just kind of light blocking material? I've never used it once. <laughs> it is, it is light blocking material. Um, I don't know if I have, well, here's the silver tape that he's talking about. And it has an adhesive back, and it's basically aluminum foil with an adhesive side. And um, I, I started including that in my kits. There are a few instances where, I, where, especially with the long lenses, so um, an SD40 or a GP40 that's using like a seven millimeter long fitting, 
there are because the LEDs are so bright, there have been instances where the roof or the the number board housing was glowing because right. the, the plastic is thin and the and the factory didn't apply the, the the paint application was thin. I'm not saying the factory should apply it thicker. That would probably not look good. But um, some shells will glow a little, and so it, it, I, I have that right now with a with a P2K switcher that's sitting sitting on my on my desk for me to get back to it. Um, it's you know how they have the little housing that kind of mounts to the end of the hood yeah and and where that housing meets the hood glows so yeah. i thought okay what am i going to do about that now the silver tape's not going to help me with that i imagine i could solve that with some of the black paint that you had recommended to me yes yeah this this one's crinkled up because i squeeze it all the time but this is americana writer don't you wish that bottle was just a skosh thinner? <laughs> uh, as far as because sometimes I'm trying to get it into the shell and I have to apply it with oh. a, little, a little spatula or something because it's just too wide to get in there. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, this um, uh, this writer and it's and other brands make writer paint, but what it is, it's very thick, very opaque. Right. And um, yeah, so for those, I've I've run into that instance that you're talking about the P2K. And you can actually use this as an adhesive. And so I would take the end of that P2K light fitting and paint the back side of it using a micro brush. Sure. And then pin it, poke it back onto the shell and press it down. And this black paint will seal that gap. Like and, a gasket. And glue it in. And then if there's any, if any of the black paint squeezes out, you just run a toothpick around the edge. It goes, it goes right away. So, um, yeah, you, I mean, you're right. The, uh, mo almost all of my products were developed to make my life as an installer more efficient and more sane. Yep. Well, I, I guess one of my requests to you would be from a reordering standpoint, I would love to have, I'd love to be able to order by part number. As in like, go to the well, website and put in a part number? Take my last order, for example, a bag of um, uh, speakers for the Cato SD40. Um, I, I don't know the part number of that. So right. the way to order it on the website is to go page by page till you get to the K's, right? And order it. Is there another way to do it? No, um, that's what I had. I had one person email me a, a few days ago saying, um, I wish that like your product page was broken up by like EMD section and ALCO section, or maybe by, you know, manufacturers or whatever. And, um, you know, or that there's a search function and I've been meaning to look because I'm not a web designer. Right. And you can only, I can only do so many hats. You built well. the site yourself. Yeah. Right. I can only do so many hats. Well, so any time you spend on the site is time you're not spending on the revenue side of your business. It's, it's time people aren't getting their orders. Right. So, <laughs> um, so I do want to look into adding a search fee feature. I have considered breaking it down into make and model. So all your atherns would be on this page, all your atlas would be on this page. But that's, but then again, that's also then for a person who, most of my customers are buying a variety of makes and models. So that's then a lot of menu and page hopping. True. And so my current putting all the diesel speakers on one page alphabetically by make and model, um, you know, so like F, an F unit would come before an SD unit, you know, um, and obviously the manufacturers are alphabetical. Um, Wait, there's more than one way to get it? I've only done the manufacturer thing. There's, a, there's another way to look at products on your website? No, it's just that list. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So just listing everything alphabetically um, is what I thought was the most logical way to do it, at least for now. And that's what I said to him. I'm like, you know, I'm doing the best I can. I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to show 200 plus speakers in a way that's user friendly and easy. It's not easy. Because you're gonna be doing a lot of searching regardless. And uh, and so I'm still not sure if I like 
the menu driven aspect of doing an Atherin section and an Atlas section and a BLI section, a Rapido section. You I don't could know just be I'm, trading one problem for another. Right. So, but I do want to try to see if I can implement a search tool because that would be, I think, helpful. It might be because if you just want a particular thing, you could sort of zero right in on it. Yeah. And I do have that PDF that I emailed you. It's available yes. for download and it lists everything alphabetically and it shows the make and model and the skew and the dimensions. Um, so people can do that. The issue there is that um, a lot, if you don't, if you're not a hundred percent sure about what the frame and mechanism looks like, you know, you don't have a photo to actually compare. You and, may recall, we had some back and forth about some situations where I had custom milled some Atlas classic weights and we were looking for something that would fit in that spot. And I basically, and we went back and forth with some dimensions and the one, the one we selected and zeroed in on that, perfect. Oh, so good. it's going to it's going to allow I think a lot of retrofitting uh, of those uh, as long as my milling was consistent, which is you know pretty pretty consistent I think. Yeah. Um, I, I used to leave just a, a shelf to, to attach everything to. Right. So in that case, obviously the speaker is pointing up, but then it's it's reflecting off of a sealed uh, shell typically. So. Right. And then, it, yeah, all that, yeah, the high frequencies will just bounce up into the shell and diffuse down. It, right. It's not, I think some- Because yeah, any attenuation of those highs is usually not a bad thing. Right, a lot of times it's not. So, you know, again, I do have one particular customer who is obsessed with orienting, orienting the speakers a certain way because, but I think he's got some high frequency hearing damage from years of-, of Former musician? <laughs> no, actually, actually, he uh, uh, well, he worked for a rail car manufacturer, and he's done a variety of things. But he's probably got some higher frequency hearing loss from the course of his life, you know. So he it might be a little bit more sensitive to him. So when he gets sure. it the way he likes it, everybody else goes, oh. <laughs> well, actually, he's one of my. I'm, I'm gonna. He's going to remain nameless, but. <laughs> He's, uh, he's one of my biggest uh, advocates, one of my earliest advocates, and um, every club that he is a member of, uh, club members usually end up ordering from me because he, he, he does love that beefy, you know, thump out of it. So, I Well, just... you know, I would say we're still relatively new to your, to your product line as compared to everything else that we do. I mean, we're a, we're a low sound uh, shop. We also do soundtracks, but... 99% of my business is Loc Sound. And as you know, with Loc Sound, there's a variety of recordings. Mm -hmm. And not all of those recordings are, are created equal. Right. Uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll pick a, uh, you know, a 645 uh, turbo recording and go, ah, and it's like the wrong one. I inadvertently selected one that is not as good as some of the others, you know? Yeah. So um, there's, there's so many variables in, in terms of that. But I, I also now... I want to start exploring how your speakers go with a non-turbo EMD 645 and uh, what it sounds like with the Alcos and what it sounds like with, with uh, different GE recordings because there's a lot of those too, you know? Yeah. So um, there's plenty of, plenty of opportunities. Um, of course, tonight I'll probably have nightmares about my installed bass coming back to me with everything saying, let's, let's swap out these I-4s for uh, JT speakers. <laughs> 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 hopefully it's easy enough that you can be like just order it and swap it yourself <laughs> most of those customers probably should send it back to me okay <laughs> and it's not a knock on the customers but you know how how it is when you complete an install uh oh, yeah. you, you know, it's there's a diff different approaches to it and uh, I think sometimes retrofits are trickier than a new install in many, in many ways. Oh yeah. When you had to, especially in the earlier days, you had to create all kinds of situations just to make it work. So, well, I, I kind of cut my teeth on um, my own fleet and, and uh, other uh, ops crew members fleets that were, uh, you know, hardwired NCE DASR decoders, you know, yeah. and, now it's time to put tsunamis in there. And, and then when we upgraded to the Loxon decoders, you're doing it all over again. So, you know, no, no plug and play in any of those locomotives. You know, you better no, be comfortable I mean, with your soldering iron. Oh yeah, that's what, 
that's what I am. I am in love with the 21 pin format. And this is a decoder buddy. Right. The mixed trains. And this little sucker will cover probably 85 or 90 percent of I mean, it, there's hard, there's hard, very rarely is there a locomotive model that this won't fit. And then you can just I can tell you one. I tried that in a scale trains uh, unit the other day because the factory motherboard was bad and the pins are too tall. Wouldn't fit. Oh, no, he he lengthened the pins to a comp to be, to make it much more comfortable with soundtracks, which is a little bit thicker. Okay. And what I do in those situations is once the decoder is seated down. Dremel. Nope. No, 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 not, not that. <laughs> Golly, Ned. They're just flush cutters. Okay. And you just go and you just nip them right across the top, flush to the top of the header. Seems like an elegant them. solution. You just make sure that none of the little brass nippings get down to the decoder or anything like that. You probably can, take the decoder off after you do that store. and blow it out. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. But um, Nick said, Nick said, just just trim the pens if you got to. And there have been a couple of <clears throat> switchers and that kind of thing where that extra pen length was just enough, and you just I just nipped them off, and it was perfect. Nice. I uh, I did try your uh, your scale train speaker in the SD40-2. That's a big improvement. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked it. Big that, improvement. That's a difficult... Um, I love scale trains. I love the people there and I love the product they make. Um, I'm not I'm my a, favorite loco to disassemble in terms of swapping out the speaker. I think they started with the speaker and then assembled the entire locomotive around. around it. Yeah. yeah. That's the challenge is that it's um, a little bit more labor intensive to replace the speaker. And the, the fact that the speaker is, is from the design perspective is small and sandwiched between metal weights. I wish, um, again, I'm not, a, I'm not really an HO modeler and I own some HO scale trains locomotives because I just- Oh, you're not? What are you, I'm, N scale? I'm mainly N scale, yeah. Really? No wonder <laughs> you're designing your own speakers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're waiting, for, we're waiting for N sound to mature a little bit more. I, I, I did a lot of installs with N scale locomotives and then, um, and then ESU dropped a few products, uh, temporarily at least. And um, they're, I keep being told that they're coming. New new format, new form factors that are gonna be suitable for N scale, hopefully this year. Well, so you don't mean the micro? The, the new micro um, is actually thicker than the, than the selector V4 micro because of the next 18 interface. And so that, um, it doesn't always cause a problem, but I, I kind of just resigned myself that uh, I'm not building a layout right now. And, and I thought I've got time to let, to let, to let it mature. What's the rush? Exactly. Yeah. You want to be in the bleeding edge of that. And, and then, well, I mean, I was five years ago. And so, uh, you know, I did a Kato in scale NW2. Um, Possibly and, my least favorite one to do. And uh, especially it, if you want a, a, uh, a current keeper. Yeah, well, well, I just did the HO one. I did an HO one for a guy um, just a month ago, and it turned out fantastic. But it, we had to mill. We had right. to mill. I mean, that it's just a block of lead. Solid metal. Yeah. Wor worse than an old P2K uh, SD50. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you take the sawzall too. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but um. So you have speakers. You have LEDs. You sell different brands of decoders. I think we talked about. Uh, before the show, you carry soundtracks, you carry Log Sound, you carry TCS. Yes. What else do you sell? Um, I've got some detail parts. Um, again, I, I've got four different versions of ditch lights um, that, again, were made. Um, it was it, I needed the part, and I couldn't find anything commercially available that was exactly the prototype I needed. What, and, what was uh, the prototype uh, that, that those were designed for? Um, the, the, the bracketed pilot mount ditch lights were for uh, Florida East Coast. And the, this client that I have who sends me dozens of, and he's a great guy. He sends me a lot of work. And I thought if I've got eight SD40-2s with ditch lights on both ends, um, uh, there's no way I'm gonna scratch build or there's no way I'm going to modify, you know, because that's what I would do in the past. I would use bits of styrene and build up the bracket, 
and and use uh like a details west backup light right and and i thought i'm not doing that 30 times so it's time to look at some real ones take some measurements take some photos draw it up in cad and um just start making them so i would it's safe to say at this point you've got pretty good cad skills because everything you do starts out in the computer i have the cad skills that i need uh if somebody asked me to draw something for them in cad i'm not the guy to ask do you enjoy uh, it i enjoy creating i like uh i mean i'm a creative person anyway that's just everything about my life has been that way but um it can be fulfilling to manufacture a part and then see it and then right use it. Um, came out of here and now you're holding it that's that's pretty cool yeah. yeah and when other people like it that's just uh that's very it's just gravy yeah because i didn't think anybody would really get what i was doing or that they would care well, I mean, you know, when you're kind of on the on the fringe, you know, you're pushing the envelope a little bit and usually things kind of follow along behind you. Right. So, you know, you're you're pioneering in a way uh, some of this stuff. Right. Trying to anyway. Yeah. What else do you have besides ditch lights? Uh, strobes. Um, I've got uh, some strobe brackets with little strobe uh, strobe lenses that are in different heights. Um, those are, uh, they were, some of them were designed for specific Chessy system family railroads. Some of them were designed for uh, LNN, SCL railroads, but you know, there's crossover, of course. Um, other prototypes would use some of this stuff. Yep. Do you, uh, do you have a layout in your future? Uh, well, yeah, I haven't, I was working on a switching layout, an HO switching layout that you see in some of my videos on YouTube. Um, and I, it, it hasn't been touched in five years. Um, so I, I, I was having a lot of fun detailing it and hand laying all the track and, and uh, scratch building the structures and that kind of thing. And, and I've built a lot of layouts with uh, friends at their houses. Um, track work is one of my favorite things to do. And so- Not surprised. Um, hand laying and, and, and even, good quality commercial components, you know, um, I just, I love doing track work. Um, but, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't had time to do any of my modeling since scale sound systems became popular. Right. And I was so, wondering if you had like a, a particular prototype that, you know, was your, your goal at some point or are my, you a freelance kind of guy? No, no, no. I'm a, I'm a, I'm one of those, uh, I'm not critical of what anybody likes. I celebrate the whole range of model railroader. So uh, I'm not one of those uppity people, but I, I am very much a, like an RPM rivet counter kind of guy. I'm all about um, authenticity. Um, you select a railroad, you select a year. Right. Everything falls within that, you know. Um, Conrail Lehigh line, 1984. Right. And I'm also like, yeah, I haven't settled on my year, but it's 84, 85, maybe ah. 86. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I, it's, you still had cabooses and right. there wasn't. Um, That's why I moved back to 84 because by 85, a lot of it was going away. Right. And there wasn't a lot of graffiti. There was maybe right. a little bit, but not much. Right. Uh, there weren't conspicuity stripes. I hate conspicuity stripes. Me too. They just look <laughs> wrong. You know, and you still had a lot of diversity with motive power and rolling stock, because you would see some veterans from the 60s and even late 50s still roaming the rails. And if there was a wide nose, it was because it was a CN unit, damn it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it was a, it's, yeah, it's just, what I what I what I'm working toward, and I do hope to be able to start on a layout maybe this year. So, what would be your prototype? It's Chessy system. It is Chessy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So right now I'm just kind of narrowing down. Better what keep buying I, those tangent coal hoppers. <laughs> well, but I'm in scale. If tangent I forgot would forgot about that. If it's tangent, a whole different and, problem. Yeah. And if he's listening, uh. You know, if he makes them in end scale, I'm buying probably two of every road number because I'll do empties and loads. Right. And uh, 
yeah, it, uh, that's what Blaine uh, with Arrowhead last month, which I thought that was such a fascinating, enjoyable interview to uh, watch and listen to. Blaine's a good and, guy. And after I watched that interview, I started an email and then I didn't, I didn't even send it because I'm like, I was going to tell him how great his interview was and how much I enjoyed it and everything. But I was just going to tell him, can you do this, do some of this stuff in N-Scale? And he's right. already got, he already has too much. <laughs> well, right. When you start thinking about the one man nature of it and you think, how would I do that if I were Blaine? I couldn't right. do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm you know, he's got one man shops, you know, we, we kind of, you know, we have our pros and cons, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're nimble. <laughs> right. We're nimble. And I like working alone, honestly. Um, you know, I spent so much, so many years touring, living on a, on a bus with people and, um, you know, and working in uh, with large teams and that kind of thing. And when I'm in the studio with bands, you know, I love that. No, I'd really, there's really nowhere else I'd rather be than in the studio with the a studio band. Studio is great. Um, but um, other than that, I'm, I'm really content to be alone. And um, I put on my music and, right. and I can, I can waste away just working the whole day. And Wait a minute, are we talking about me or you now? Yeah, happy as a clam. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. I love people, but I, I can get peopled out quicker than most. People. Even I found, even when I went to a proto meet, um, and of course, I, a lot of my best friends I met at, at, at proto meets. Yeah. Uh, and there was a time period where I was going to everything, you know, but yeah. I could get saturated you know, and, and yeah. invariably in the course of a day, I just go back to my room and just be quiet for an hour, you know, mm -hmm. just to let the circuits cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love the RPMs and we have a two day one here every year in Marion, Ohio. Oh yes. And uh, I love it. Yeah. It's who's the time. driving force on that? Who's the. Uh, Dennis Blake. Dennis Blake. Yes. Robert, I know Dennis. Uh, oh, I always get, no, it's. Oh, uh, the guy from Savannah. Um, he's Bob he's Harp. Bob, he's Bob. No, it, maybe. Bob Harp is from Savannah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is Bob that he's with. Yeah, that sounds uh, right. And I think uh, I met Dennis at Bob's Savannah meet one time way oh, back okay. in the day. Yeah, yeah, they do they do that stuff together, Marion right. and Savannah. Um, yeah, after you know, I love it. It's a fantastic time, and sometimes I give clinics. But after that two days, I just need to decompress. It's exactly it, it's mentally and, and mentally and emotionally it, it's taxing. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, my you know, my wife tells me that there's basically two kinds of people. Some some people are energized from all of that human contact, and some people are drained by it. And right. it doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you don't like people. Right. It just means that after after a couple of days, <laughs> you just don't want to talk to anybody for a right. day or two. That is, the, that is the main difference between an introvert and extrovert. It isn't, it isn't how you act around people. It's not like if you're around people and you shut down, you're an introvert. That's not the defining factor of introvert and extrovert. It's where you draw your energy. Correct. And, and for me, you know, when I'm writing songs and creating things, uh, being alone is the, and being alone for hours and hours, for days. Well, you, you get lost like, in it. You get immersed in it, right? You, I, yeah. I call it getting in the flow of, of something. Right. And, you know, when, when, I'm, when I'm hitting on all cylinders, you know, I might have gone downstairs at 1, 1 uh, you know, p.m. Next thing I know, it's 7 p.m. and I'm getting hungry. Yeah. And that six hours, you know, went by like that. And that's right. when I know I'm, I'm doing it right, you know? Right. That's when it feels right. Right. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I think you covered it unless you got something else that, uh, that you want to get out there. No, I mean, if, if, uh, I don't know if you have any other questions or anything like that. Uh, I've got, um, I have a new range of speakers that are going to come out next month. Um, when you say February, new February, meaning um, with new drivers or new boxes yeah. or new what? Both. Um, okay. So I'm trying to hit some of the steam guys a little bit better. Um, and um, so I've got, but then I also discovered that I can, that this works really well. So I don't have, uh, no. So this right here is uh, the top of what uh, the Athern, you know, um, Genesis F unit speaker looks like. And 
normally there is a driver right here. Um, the new line of speakers has a new driver that um, I was designing for uh, tender mount, like subwoofers in tenders. I started playing around with it in, in the largest diesel uh, designs and this thing will rattle the shell off the chassis. Is it, that your first round one? It is actually, yeah. Um, hmm. it, my, my first round production. I've done some round designs for steam engines uh, for clients. Sure. Um, doing subwoofer type things. Um, but I just never got around to releasing that line. And, um, but this is the first time that, um, this is the first round driver that I've gotten to perform this way in any of the systems that'll fit in my diesels. Now it, it still won't fit your narrow hood stuff, um, but it'll be available in, all, in a variety of E unit, F unit, um, wide body type stuff. And it, I think, that it's gonna fit the Genesis ES44 and SD70 Ace because they use that big vertical round speaker over the drive shaft. So this right here is my ES44 speaker that straddles the drive shaft. Um, and I think that I'm gonna be able to make the design. I haven't tested it yet, we're gonna see, but that would be a, a, a boon for those guys because this thing is, uh, this thing is, is gonna, make some noise well you're not bored no no yeah i that's what um i'm thinking i'm releasing another line of speakers uh why <laughs> just because you can doesn't mean you should <laughs> there's got to be something driving it that that uh you're again you're you're pushing the envelope again right yeah i mean it's really just it's just i get a kick out of it and um you know, it makes it makes people happy, I guess. So we'll see where this goes. Well, if I come up with a need that's not something you've already addressed, I won't hesitate to run it by you. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is sometimes sometimes people ask, you know, I was looking at this and and it doesn't look like it's going to work for me. And they don't realize that, well, this product would actually fit better, even though it wasn't intended for that, you know. Exactly. And that's, and that's part of getting to know the line. But again, you have... Uh, an intimidating quantity of SKUs, you know, it, it's, uh, it's almost like you'd want to order one of each and glue them to a board with the, <laughs> <laughs> with the name above it. <laughs> should I, uh, should I, should I offer that the scale sound system speaker sampler? I'm that thinking that's not a bad <laughs> idea. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, uh, it, uh, I have created a beast that um, is increasingly coming dif becoming difficult to, to tame. Um, so it's it's wearing on me, but I'm, I'm hanging in there. And- um, All about it, managing expectations, right? And that's why your installs sit there. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah. I've, I've, had, to, I've had to clear that part out of my life and, uh, and make, up, make some room for myself, you know, and, so February is going to be a busy month. I'm not releasing those speakers until the end of the month because I'm working on two full length records in February in the studio. Mm. So, um, so I should order soon. Uh, well, right now my order backlog and I apologize to everybody. <laughs> these, these are currently the orders. Each sheet is an order. Um, so I'm, I'm doing my best. Everyone who's ordered in the last week, I'm really, I'm in here cranking on it, but there's a lot. So, all right. So, <laughs> so stop talking to me and get to work. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm going home to my wife now because I've been gone all day. All but, right. So the name of the company is scale sound systems and the URL is scale sound systems.com. How could I remember that? Okay. <laughs> JT. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and um, I think that we're going to be talking about this for quite some time. Well, hopefully, it was a pleasure to be on uh, on your new format. I really like I really like the video format you started last month, and uh, yeah, I don't know if every podcast is going to lend itself to that, but we'll see. Yeah.
This is only number two, so I have to watch it again. You know, first I have to get used to my melon talking back to me, you know? <laughs> right. No, it was a pleasure being here, though. JT, have a great night. Thanks. You too, Mike. Take care. Bye. <laughs>